Okay. So welcome everybody to our virtual event. Um, I am Julie, the events manager at Roundabout Books here in beautiful Bend, Oregon. And we are so happy to have Johanna Stoberock uh, joining us to discuss her novel, Pigs, which I actually have with me. So I'll show everybody the cover. Um, it's a beautiful book in itself. Um, I love the size. Like I just think the trim size is very nice. It's very nice to hold in your hands. So. We are recording this so that we can share it on YouTube and social media later. So um, as people come in and out, um, I'll just approve them and then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you um, to just tell us about the book and yourself as a writer, I guess. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to say thank you so much for having me. I, of course, would be much, much prefer to be there in person, but this seems like the next best thing. Um, I'm really excited to read from pigs and um, so, so glad that you asked me to share it with um, your readers, your customers. Um, so pigs was published in October of last year by Red Hen Press. Um, it uses a fabulous premise to um, get at questions about environmental and social responsibility. The setup is um, it follows um, four children who live on an island that serves as a repository for the entire world's garbage. And the system on the island goes like this. Uh, ships pass by, they drop the garbage in the water. The garbage washes to the island shores. The children gather up the garbage and then they feed it to a herd of giant, magical, insatiable pigs. Um, and it's a perfect system. The world doesn't have to think about any of the garbage that it creates. The pigs can make anything unwanted disappear. If they occasionally snap off a, child, a child's finger in the process, so be it. Nobody cares about the children, nobody thinks about the children, and the children don't have um, really any sense that their lives could unfold in a different way. Um, but one day a barrel washes to shore and um, when the children pry it open, they find a small boy inside and they have to decide whether he's another child like them or if he's more garbage meant to be fed to the pigs. And that's where the story gets going. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is read um, from the beginning of the novel just to give you a sense of the world that it takes place in, of its setting, of its tone, um, and then read a little bit about um, the novel's secondary character, a middle-aged man named Otis, uh, and then end the reading with a series of very, very short chapters um, that think in particular about the things that we throw away. And each chunk of the reading should last about five minutes. So I'll go ahead. The pigs ate everything. Kitchen scraps, bitter lettuce from the garden, the stale and sticky contents of lunch boxes kids brought home from school, toenail clippings, hairballs pulled up from the drain. But after the pigs were done, there weren't even any teeth left over not even any metal from cavities filled long ago. They lived in a pen out back. The land was rocky but spacious and the pen had been tucked in a corner out of sight for more years than any of the children could remember. It was made out of wood, gray splintered boards nailed together in a haphazard way. Every five feet, the wood was anchored by posts. When you stood by the fence, the pigs lumbered over grunting and stuck their snouts out between the rickety slats. It wasn't always that they expected food. Sometimes they just wanted their snouts scratched. Sometimes they just grunted happily and settled back down in the shade. There were six of them. They never fought. They seemed to smile when you approached, but you had to be quick. If you brought a bucket of slop and poured it out too slowly without moving your hand away, you never knew what could happen. Louisa was missing a finger. Not an important one, just her left hand pinky where she hadn't moved away quickly enough one hot summer afternoon when she was feeding them shoes. It was summer every afternoon there, soft and lazy and slow. The pinky came off in one clean bite before she even realized what was happening. She left with a feeling of shame, like it had been her fault the pig grabbed her finger. 
She wrapped her hand in her skirt and kept her mouth shut, and the stub didn't start hurting until she lay down for the night. The land was actually an island. The island was surrounded by water that glinted green in the sun and clouded to gray in the shade. Some might have let the pigs run free, feral among the scrubby bushes. The pigs could have rooted happily for mushrooms or truffles, found entire brambles of berries to eat and maybe left the children alone. They could have grabbed the entire world's detritus without anyone's help but the grown-ups preferred the pigs confined. They preferred the relative safety of the fence. Louisa had lived on the island forever, or for as long as she could remember, which was the same as forever. There were other children too, three of them. Andrew, who sang in his sleep and had straw-colored hair. Mimi, who was older or at least taller than the rest, and who liked to pretend she knew much more about the world than anyone else and who couldn't grow her hair long no matter how hard she tried. There was even a toddler. They called her Natasha. Her head was covered with loose blonde curls. She couldn't have been more than three and she giggled every time she heard the grunting of the pigs. They were all afraid of the gray water, of the sea in a mood of despair. It wrapped the island like a scarf made of grief. It made you choke with tears to touch it. It didn't take long for Louisa's finger to heal into a nice neat stump. She rubbed it sometimes and whispered to herself that it was time to grow up and stop being so clumsy. It was her fault she'd lost a finger. The pigs were fast, but if she'd been a little more agile, they'd have snapped at air. She wondered what she'd tasted like. She hoped she tasted good, but not so good that the pig would want more. She tried to remember which one it was that had snapped at her, but even though she was pretty sure it was the one with black spots, she wasn't sure enough to say. Sometimes the children tested what the pigs would eat, the leather flaps of shoe tongues, the bent frames of glasses, Mardi Gras beads, tin cans, pistols, cap guns. There seemed to be no limit to their appetite. The children would stand a few feet away from the fence and toss whatever they were testing high into the air. The pigs moved with an unexpected grace, opening their long mouths and catching whatever came sailing down directly between their teeth. The pigs were remarkable. The children watched them with amazement, their own mouths open, their hands now empty, coming together of their own will to clap. Hubcaps, the tassels off bicycle handlebars, empty jars of mayonnaise, gone, all gone in seconds. The grown-ups on the island frowned at the children and never even pretended to help them with their chores. They drank espresso and smoked cigarettes and plugged their noses dramatically whenever the children got too close. As far as the children could tell, the grown-ups never cooked. When Natasha fell into the gray water and came out covered in spots and filled with an unquenchable thirst for a parent that even Mimi couldn't solve, the grown-ups flinched at the sight of her. What are they here for, Louisa said. Sometimes she thought, maybe we should just feed them to the pigs. Ships passed by from time to time, usually large cargo ships, but sometimes ocean liners. It was possible the island looked beautiful from a distance. When a ship edged onto the horizon, the children ran to the top of the highest rock and waved. They made Andrew take his shirt off and Mimi circled it above her head. They didn't shout. They knew their voices weren't strong enough to carry all that way. And they didn't really want the grown-ups to hear them. Not that the grown-ups had ever shown they'd cared, but this was private and they'd agreed to do it in silence. Only once it seemed that they'd been sighted, but the only difference it made was that a barrel washed up on shore instead of the usual junk. They spent an entire day trying to pry it open, and when they finally got inside, all they found was another child sleeping. His name was Eddie. So that's the beginning of, of the novel. Um, and the first chapter extends for about another, about another 10 or 12 pages. Um, 
And then it ends and the next chapter starts by introducing another character. And that character is um, a middle-aged castaway named Otis. And I named him Otis because when I was kind of, when I was writing the novel and sort of trying to figure out what it was, I sort of thought of the island where the children were as like maybe another island that Odysseus maybe wandered to on his journey home. Um, and so I gave him a name that kind of echoed with Odysseus. But the more research I did, um, I, I started thinking about Otis elevators. And I was really um, pleased to find that um, elevators are, are more often repaired than they are thrown away just because it's just so hard to get them out of buildings. Um, and I think of Otis as somebody who is like always on the road to sort of throwing himself away and that his journey in the novel is towards repair. So it seemed very fitting um, for him. Um, so I'm going to read the chapter where he first enters the novel. It's very short. Otis couldn't stop crying, even though he knew he was wasting whatever liquid his body had left. His eyes were full of sand. The tears washed the grit from his eyes, which was some consolation, but not enough. At least it restored vision, which after five days drifting on the lid of a packing crate at sea was a pretty big deal. If he lifted his head slightly from where it was wedged into the sand, he could see the coast, rocky, dry, dotted with bursts of purple flowers, pushing out of cliffs, maybe enough driftwood on the beach to build a shelter. There were birds, seagulls anyway. They stood in the line and looked at him. He could swear they were looking right at him. He thought he heard a dove. He crawled away from the water and his body left a long track behind him on the sand. He had no idea how long it took to be able to stand up, but it happened. At one point, his cheek was shoved against a rough pillow of sand, and at the next, he was standing with his knees shaking, the breeze from the ocean on his neck. Even though it had happened five seconds ago, he couldn't say how he'd gotten from one position to the other. Something rubbed against his throat. He lifted his hand and felt the smooth surface of a metal pendant. A necklace? He remembered he'd had a necklace. The chain was heavy against his battered skin. He dragged driftwood into a pile. He hobbled to the place where the sand stopped and vegetation began. He listened and heard a stream and bushwhacked through thorny bushes until he found fresh water. Then he got back down on his knees and stuck his face in and drank. Alice had once washed his hair under the bathtub faucet when he'd had the flu and was too sick to climb into the tub. It felt like that now, head in the stream, water in his mouth. It felt like someone loved him. He thought he could drink that water forever. But before too long, he started to shake again and he thought three hours without shelter, three days without water, three weeks without food. Where did he know that from? Boy Scouts? Had he ever really been a boy? He'd learned that during some kind of wilderness training, was this the wilderness? Somehow he'd always imagined wilderness to be about trees, shelter, water, food. He cupped his palm and lifted water to his mouth and took another swallow and realized he was doing everything in the wrong order, as usual. He hobbled back through the brambles to the beach. He had more energy now. At least the water had given him that. He should stay close to the ocean, so if a ship did pass by and he did see it, he had some way of letting it know he was there. A voice at the back of his mind told him no one would care. He tried not to listen. He'd always tried not to listen to what people told him about himself. That voice had been telling him to let go the whole time he'd been floating in the ocean. And look how wrong it had been. Look where he was. He even had fresh water. The line of gulls stared, gulls stared at him and one turned her head and her eyeball glittered and he noticed that the sun was sinking low. Night was on its way and he was hungry. He couldn't decide what to do first, shelter or food, find more water or build a fire. There were too many choices, even the limited options were overwhelming. Life had always been that way for him. He'd never been able to make up his mind. He lifted his hand to the pendant at his throat and thought, this is what I do when I think. I hold this pendant. This is who I am. 
He fiddled with the pendant, found himself fumbling at a hinge. Not a pendant, he thought, a locket. I hold the socket and I flip its catch open and closed until I can make a choice. He pulled the locket's door open. Alice stared out at him, a smile on her long mouth, her light brown hair pushed back behind her ears. She was young in the picture, in her 20s maybe. She was wearing a flowered shirt. He remembered that shirt. He'd called her his flower child when she wore it. Across from Alice, their son stared out from years ago. Round baby eyes, not yet a real color. A blue hat on his bald head. Otis shut the door. He opened it again. He shut it and opened it and shut it and opened it, trying to make a choice. But there wasn't really a choice. The rule of threes. It had to be shelter and soon. He shoved the, a couple sticks together to make a kind of lean-to. It had gaps, but if he scooted his body inside, his head was covered and only his legs were exposed to the wind that was kicking up now from the water. He could sort of see the stars through the gaps where, when night really fell. The stars here were just as bright as they'd been when he'd clung to wood in the middle of the ocean. Just as bright, if not brighter. He fell asleep trying to remember methods for making fire without a match. Flint, hand drill, bow drill, magnifying glass. There had to be other ways he just couldn't remember. The locket was cold on his skin. So there's Otis. Um, and I guess when I think of the characters in the novel, I think of the island itself as a pretty important character. And throughout the novel, I have a series of very, very short chapters that I kind of use to punctuate the movement of it, to slow down or speed up pacing, um, to acknowledge a debt to other desert pieces of desert island literature, um, and to think in close detail about the things we throw away. And so I thought I'd, um, read just three very, very short, um, short uh, pieces of these, these little chapters. From a distance, the island looks so small that ocean liners moving past described it to their passengers as nothing but an unnamed, uncharted outcropping of rock. Cruise directors announced over loudspeakers that some people said it was the island where the sirens tried to lure sailors to their death. Listen closely, they said, and you'll hear something that sounds like a song. From time to time, a half-drunk divorcee jumped into the water and required rescue from irritated sailors. From time to time, passengers gathered on deck to sigh at the dark outline the island made against the orange setting sun. But nobody noticed the trails of refuse that formed a path over the water as the ship steamed on. It was official policy never to look back. It was official policy to believe the world stopped once it could no longer be seen. From a distance, seen from above, the island was shaped like a kidney. It had a wide curved side and a long indented side and two shorter rounder ends. From sea level, it looked like a perfectly shaped mountain, all of it rising at the same angle to a peak at its very center. There wasn't any control room anywhere, no master plan for a magic island that served as the world's dump. It just was, and people just knew about it if they thought about it at all. And ships just brought their stuff there as if by instinct. Plastic bottles because no one trusted tap water, fur coats that were splashed with paint, television screens that simply weren't flat enough, weight loss and weight loss competitions, mother's wedding dresses that daughters had no interest in wearing, love poems written by boyfriends long ago, toothpaste samples from the dentist. The ship brought it and slipped it into the water when no one was watching, and once in the water, it vanished completely. Spools of film that no one remembered how to process, dolls with broken arms, income tax information that went back more than seven years, half-eaten cupcakes, half-read novels, shrunken sweaters, chipped teacups. From the outside, with perspective, it all looked smoothed and beautiful. The island's perfect peak, 
the sun forever setting or forever rising and never stuck at a punishing noonday height. But on the island itself, where even the idea of perspective did not exist, everything arrived in its particularity. From the island, it was the ships that seemed a single entity. What was discarded was unique, who discarded it was not. From a distance, living on an island is lots of children's dream. No parents, no bedtime, no need to grow up. Mermaids and pirates in the water, lost boys living underground. From a distance, living on an island is lots of parents' nightmare. Children turning into savages, rival factions raiding one another's camps, flies buzzing round the rotting heads of carcasses. From either distance, the children ultimately leave. From either distance, the island gets tucked away as something to imagine, but never to believe in. And then I just, I wanted to close um, the reading with um, something that's not quite as dark as, as the other sections. And there is a lot of darkness in the novel, but there are also a lot of moments of beauty and reprieve. And so I just want to close the, the reading with one of those. Very short. They stayed down by the water while the sun set. They were still down by the water when the moon came out. On that island, when there were no clouds, the stars were always bright. It didn't matter if the moon was full and hogging half the sky. The stars formed a tight path over the crown of night, and Louisa easily dreamed of walking that path into heaven. When they finally stepped away from the water and headed back up to the hut, Natasha was clutching a starfish in her hand. Inside, she curled up on her mat, the starfish pressed to her cheek, and Louisa curled up next to her. She listened to the sleepy sighs that filled the room. She heard Otis's snoring, the heavy snoring of an adult so different from the delicate snoring of children. She heard the pigs sigh outside and faint trails of music drifting from the villa and bordering it all like a ribbon round the hem of a dress. She heard the gentle sea. So that's, that's it for pigs. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, I really liked that. Um, I was reading the book today. The kids are, they form a family really fast. And obviously we've kind of maybe seen that in some other ones. There is an illusion and then someone mentions it on the back uh, in one of your blurbs of Lord of the Flies. But these kids are like, they're, they're trying to keep each other safe. They're not, you know, every man for himself. Um, and I really liked too how gentle they all are with Natasha and especially Mimi. Like it's a very surrogate mother relationship and it's very sweet like that. So, um, and that may actually make it harder to, to read, right? Because these kids are very sweet and innocent and then they're in a terrible situation. Yeah, it's true. I mean, they seem, um, you know, they're so much more generous than any of the adults on the island, and they seem to um, have a real sense of each other's well-being. I mean, they, you know, they're kids and they react yeah. with anger and frustration to each other, but they also really care about each other deeply. Yeah, yeah, it's very sweet. So we do have a couple people um, who've joined us, and I just want to open it up if anyone has questions. We can either have you um, unmute your mic or I can uh, read it from the, the chat window if, if anyone you know, has a preference. Um, does anyone have a question for our author? I've got one person. Let's see here. I don't, I don't have any questions. No? Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us just the same. <laughs> um, so let's see here. We'll go back to why is it doing that? I think there's this chat button. We did have oh. someone who had joined us earlier, but she was having a little bit of issues with the audio, so she's going to check it out when we post it to YouTube. Um, so I guess maybe let's talk about um, what uh, you know why you wrote it. Like, what was the you know you 
we talk a little bit about, you know, there's an environmental standpoint and where does the waste go? And also, um, I grew up on some small, I say farms, but we really only had like a couple horses, a couple cows, a couple pigs. So these pigs can eat everything, but there's no waste byproduct? I know. Well, they're magical. Okay. Because that was confusing at first. I'm like, mm -hmm. wait. There's yes, there should be. There waste. should be some problems with that. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, it's definitely like not a system that would work in the real world. Um, so it's funny. I was yesterday. I was at an event where I was talking with um, a number of people who are involved in circular economy, which is a kind of way of understanding economic systems that um, produce very little waste, or in which the waste is um, made useful. And they and I was I was thinking about that. So, um, in terms of where I, ideas for pigs came from, and I think that you know it came from a lot of different places, as I think most creative work does. And um, so, some of the things that it came from, like I saw this episode of Criminal Minds, where the serial killer feeds his victims to his pigs. Mm -hmm. so definitely came from, like, I think I even saw that the night before I started writing, writing the first chapter. Um, and I think I, we had gotten chickens pretty recently before I started writing. And I was just like, so happy with being able to feed my kitchen scraps to them. And so it's like this waste that before had accumulated. Now I could do something good with it. Um, but then also, I, um, we moved from the city of Walla Walla to the county and we didn't have curbside recycling anymore. And because we tend to like let things go a little bit, we used to just put all of our recyclable materials, actually we still do this on our back porch until they were overflowing and then we would take make a trip to the recycling center. And so um, I just would see everything accumulating all the time and kind of really be faced with it in ways that I um, hadn't been before. And I just kind of started thinking of it as a metaphor that I could use or sort of like a container for a story that I, that I wanted to tell or ideas that I, a container for ideas that I wanted to think about. Um, and so I started writing and it was just kind of like this fun and strange story. Um, but I, um, was started writing it very seriously in the summer of 2014. And during that summer, it felt like the news was just filled over and over and over about, um, you know, violence and injustice done to children. And I kind of realized that the metaphorical container that I'd set up was big enough or could stretch to include thinking about that as well. Okay. Yeah, and um, isn't it interesting to, I mean, I think a lot of people don't understand that authors can be working on these books for a really long time before they get to, you know, even to a publisher and then out into the world. And so in, in my head right now, thinking about maybe like recycling and, and waste management, you know, we're all home so much more. And I'm noticing that even just two people in the house, we're taking the kitchen garbage out almost every other day. And before it felt like it was maybe only every, you know, five days because we were out eating and we weren't maybe keeping track of how much we really were or, or when we were cooking at home, how much packaging there is on everything. And so it has definitely started in my head. And so then it's almost interesting to think you started writing this, you know, six years ago, but now isn't it even more applicable in that sense? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 uh, for a while, I mean, it, I am a very slow writer and it took me a long to, a, a long time to write it. And there were a number of period of moments while I was writing it where I thought, you know, like this is not really relevant anymore. Like I'm, the time is changing too, too quickly for what I'm working on. But um, sadly, I, th I think that it really is relevant um, that I think that, you know, people are more vulnerable every single day and our planet is more vulnerable and the waste that we produce 
you know, we don't have any solutions for it. Our oceans are filling up with plastic. I mean, it just, it's, yeah. it's, it's unfortunate and it's time for change. It, absolutely. Um, I will say this though, I feel like that makes your book, um, you know, an evergreen, you know, topic. It's not going to go out of uh, fashion because this is still so relevant and it will be relevant, you know, in a couple of years, hopefully maybe not less, but just <laughs> we'll think of it differently. Um, but I really appreciated in reading that. And I've been telling a couple of people, um, when they asked me what was the book about and I said well you know it's a little um it's a little scary but it's very beautifully written I said you know and so I'm I'm going through it and there's these kind of kind of you know people losing fingers but it's so beautiful so <laughs> yeah I mean it it's it's a funny thing like I um sometimes I feel like I um like some of that the violence in it like there is a lot of violence that is that is certainly true um and when I was writing it, I wasn't really thinking about the violence as like that, how it would affect readers. Like it just never occurred to me that it would be upsetting for readers. Um, and part of that is because it feels so over the top in some ways, like it's kind mm. of deliberately over to the top or like that thing of like her, you know, all these fingers that get snapped off. Like I, I almost think of them as um, like when I wrote them, Funny is not the right the right word, but like I wrote them with a sense of humor, and yet they're horrible. Um, and I think sometimes that that line between the horrible and the funny, or I like that it just kind of blends together mm -hmm. um, in uncom like in in productively uncomfortable ways. Um, it's an aesthetic that I that I um, am drawn to often. Yeah, and. Um... Obviously, we don't want to give away anything, you know, to people who are going to be uh, or who are listening and watching this later. Um, but I will say that the adults, besides Otis, that we do encounter um, are really terrible. And they are that, to me, they remind me of um, people you see on terrible reality shows or, or that kind of unfortunate caricature or what people have kind of you know they're very concerned with you know their clothing are they getting something new and yet they are treating these children terribly and that is still a very common you know occurrence in our society so um can you talk a little bit about maybe what the, the adults again, I don't want to give anything away, but like where the adults come in in this story? Yeah, so um, one of the things that I, I kind of did pretty deliberately with them is um, I, so I, I refer them to throughout always, every single time as the grown-ups and none of them have their own name. And I kind of, um, I wanted them to be kind of, um, like a flock or like a herd, like, like the pigs also like kind of mm -hmm. indistinguishable from one another acting as a collective, but as a like sort of sinister or toxic collective so that not a single one of them had to take individual responsibility for any of the um, uses or abuses of, that they um, enact towards the children. Mm -hmm. um, so somehow, because they don't have individual characters, individual personalities, they, it, there's, they don't have to take responsibility. Um, and part of what drives them on the island is just this like consumption of everything that's beautiful and um, you know, unlimited access to whatever kind of pleasure they want. Um, and I just, I, I kind of just wanted something in excess in that way to kind of um, put a spotlight on the inequities with the children. Um, so the children get to be individuals, the grownups do not. Right. Um, and you do describe the grownups a lot based on maybe their hair color. You know, yeah. you've got a man with black hair, a woman with red hair. And again, you're saying we see that with the pigs. You know, there's the, the pig with dainty feet or the one that's black and white. but um, 
and the kids don't ever name the pigs, do they? No, they don't. Okay. They only, and, and in fact, there's one that they always like, they know it's there, but they always forget about. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, um, but they, but they, um, you know, they care, like one of the things that I just really loved writing was that the pigs are actually beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. Like they're pigs, but they're graceful and they move like they have these like entertainments that they put on. And at one point, Louisa puts on glasses and can see them really clearly for just a second and they look like goddesses to her. Um, whereas the grown ups um, are, you know, dressed beautifully, but they are not beautiful at all. Um, although they have all the trappings of beauty. Um, and so that was, that was kind of a tension that I was interested in also, like the, the beauty of action versus the beauty of appearance. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm trying to think. This just, I mean, I really did enjoy reading this, I have to say. Thank and you. Um, let's, you know, just so everyone gets um, a good uh, information about you, this is your second book. That's right. Um, my first book is a novel called City of Ghosts. Um, okay. And it was, it was published by W.W. W. Norton. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you want to give us maybe just a little synopsis of that one so people can, can you check it out? It's super different than pigs. Um, so I, I kind of think of City of Ghosts as sort of like an anti-love story. Um, so it follows a young woman who falls in love super, super quickly. And um, but it, the person who she falls in love with is actually her best friend's boyfriend. And she, you know, travels across the world with him. They end up living in Nepal. And while she's there, she kind of like their romance falls apart. And so it's really about the like dissolving a, a, of their romance. Um, okay. Yeah. So mm -hmm. like really about, you know, growing into her being her own person. And are you working on anything? right now? I am, but it's super in its early stages. So better not, better <laughs> not to talk about it. Um, Ooh, but again, different not. from pigs, yeah. um, concerned with the imagination. Um, but it does not take place on an island. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. All right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think this was wonderful. Thank you so much for reading those passages. Um, like I said, we're going to get this up on YouTube so that we can share it with people who couldn't uh, join us tonight. And I do want to remind everyone that we will have uh, Johanna at the store um, in August, correct? Didn't we? Yeah, mm -hmm. in August. So watch our event calendar on Roundabout. We'll keep our fingers crossed that, you know, there's that everything can go forward with that. And if you'd like to purchase her book, um, you can check out our website at roundaboutbookshop.com or our phone number is 541-306-6564. Um, we're open right now, Monday through Saturday, uh, 10 to four, and we are always available for people to just come in and pick up a book. You don't have to like be in the store very long. We'll just hand it off to you. Um, so again, thank you so much for taking the time to join us via Zoom. This has been really great, and um, I'm really excited to, to tell more people to pick up this book because I really enjoyed it. And um, I can't think of anything else. <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. Um, yeah. And I look forward to seeing you in person in August. Yeah, it's going to be lovely. Um, have you been to Bend before? I've only driven through it. I'm super oh. excited to spend a little bit of time there. Yeah, yeah, I hope you can come down for a long weekend. It's really yeah. gorgeous. Yeah. So me too. Um, all right. Well, okay. I am going to go ahead and turn off the recording real quick.